this time, I'll call this meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society to order. My name is Richard Conkle. I'm the president of the society. Do we have uh, first time visitors here today? I think maybe we have quite a few. Okay, and I'm assuming maybe today's program brought you out. Well, we're very glad to have you with us. Um, at this time, I will ask our secretary, um, Cheryl Smith, he'll come up and give us minutes from the last meetings. Ever since Erica handed me these, thank you for filling in. <laughs> I presume it was you. Uh, minutes for February 6th. Richard Conco opened the meeting held in the library archives area to a large group of attendees and welcomed at least four newcomers. Erica Runkles read the minutes for the January 2nd meeting. Margaret Berg gave the treasurer's report as follows. The opening January bounce was balance was 17,546 16 cents with no receipts disbursements of $204.47 leaving a January 31st balance of 17,341.69 Margaret noted in her membership port report that we now had 164 members Nicole Smith announced the upcoming February program offerings for the history center and Jonathan Steyer profiled our programs for the next three months and then introduced Chip Kaufman, who was our speaker on the Celtic language influences in York County. Thank you, Jerry. Any additions or corrections? Hearing none, uh, the minute stand approved is read. This time, our treasurer, Margaret Burke, will give us a treasurer's report. Balance, excuse me, balance at February 1st, 2022 was $17,341.69. Receipts for February, membership renewals, $110, publication sales of $103, and a uh, donation for research done uh, by a member was $50 to, for the total of receipts, $263. Disbursements, program speaker for February, Charles Kaufman, $125. Postal connections for the January, February newsletter, $123.71. For total disbursements of $248.71. Leaving the uh, cash balance at February 28, 2022, $17,355.98. Uh, for membership, uh, we have um, 151 if that includes that does not that includes family member family uh, that it, there's two people. Uh, we have uh, to the end of February for this fiscal year we've had five new and in March I've received another new one 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 more new one. That's it. Thank you, Margaret. Mm -hmm. That treasurer's report will be filed for audit. Um, at this time, we'll have Nicole Smith give us information from the library and archives of the York County Heritage or York County History Center. <laughs> Thanks, Richie. Yep, it hasn't been that long, but uh, you name. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see so many faces today. Um, if you are watching from home, uh, please type any questions you have in the chat feature or in comments on Facebook. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the York County History Center YouTube channel. We have some interesting programs coming up on second Saturday. Uh, the speaker is Kim Hogman, and she'll be speaking about the Yorktown Hotel Project. Our Civil War Roundtable webinar is March 16th. And the speaker is Ron Coddington, speaking on faces of Civil War nurses. Our, we have a third Thursday webinar on the 17th. The speaker is Sandra Stockton, uh, speaking about her new book, Surviving Unpredictability. And our All Vets Oral History program is March 23rd, and that is uh, with Bob Zimmerman. We have other programs, uh, both in person and <clears throat> online. We have a new online book club called Bookmarked. We also have student and school programs. There's um, 
homeschool days activities at the Agricultural and Industrial Museum and History Makers workshops. So if you want any information about our programs, please visit yorkhistorycenter.org. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, at this time, I'll have our Vice President, Jonathan Stair, introduce today's program and give us information about upcoming meetings. Next month's meeting, the first Sunday of April, will be down at the Colonial Courthouse. And uh, if you don't know where that's at, it's on West Market Street, right before the Cadoris Creek. There is parking, there's a parking lot behind the Colonial Courthouse in Europe. Uh, we think you're welcome to park there. At least I've never had any problems parking there on the weekend. And our own Tom Gibson will be speaking about the challenges facing the Continental Congress in Yorktown. So we will be learning about the Continental Congress in a building that was reconstructed to depict the location where this activity actually happened. And then uh, the first Sunday in May will be Tyler Stump from the Pennsylvania State Archives speaking about uh, state hospitals and the institutionalization of people in Pennsylvania. So if you have ancestors who were in state hospitals, you may want to come and hear what Tyler has to say. He'll also be talking about records and how to access them through the state archives. And then to close our program here in June, the second Sunday in June, we will be having our annual uh, Henry James Young Award program. Our speaker this afternoon is Brad Emig, who's going to be talking about research, uh, 18th century gunsmithing in Eastern Pennsylvania. He is the proprietor and master craftsman of uh, Cabinet Creek guns or muzzle loading down in Helm. And he's nationally and possibly internationally recognized as one of the preeminent gun builders in the 18th uh, century using 18th century technology. And before he opened Cabin Creek uh, muzzle loading, he was also did some of the similar type work over at Landis Valley Farm Museum, north of Lancaster, and he took their collection from a static collection to a working gun shop. If you'd like to see some beautiful pictures of his work in the March, April, 2020 issue of Muzzle Loader, is a very nice article and lots of pictures of his guns. And if you don't see enough today, uh, check that out. I'm sure you probably see it online. <clears throat> one, one final thing before I let Brad speak is uh, we believe that our wives are second or third cousins. So uh, I am related to him somehow through Mary. So Brad, if you wanna come and speak to us about 18th century gunsmithing. I wanna thank you for inviting me to be here today. It's a pleasure to be here and talk with everybody. It looks like you have a pretty full house this evening. So it's nice to see everybody here today. We're on a relatively short amount of time, so I'm going to run through some of this stuff pretty quick. But Johnston assures me that we have plenty of time in the end for questions, so uh, we can address a lot of other things maybe in greater detail uh, once we get uh, to that point. So, in opening, I would like to read two quotes uh, to you. One was from 1780, and the other one will be almost 150 years later, and they have direct connection to our topic today. And it's their observations, these gentlemen's observations on uh, Pennsylvania rifles uh, and the men who used them. Uh, the first one was from British Colonel George Hanger. And if any of you know about Colonel Hanger, he was a colorful character of the American Revolution. He was serving here in the British Army. Um, and there's quite a bit of uh, interesting reading on him if you choose to do that. He was a highly educated man. Uh, he studied both in England and in Germany. So by the time the American Revolution, let's just say he's been around the block a few times and he's seen a few things. So his comments carry a certain weight to them. They weren't just they weren't, uh, uneducated comments or they weren't just on the cuff. He kept it short and sweet, but in 1780, uh, Colonel Hanger wrote, I've never in my life seen better rifles or the men who shot any better than those made in America. And that's a pretty big statement for uh, a British officer at that time. He had uh, direct knowledge of the American rifle companies and the devastation they took on the British Army. And he knew about the quality of the Pennsylvania rifles and knew about the, the skill levels of the guys who used them. So that's uh, quite a compliment coming from a British officer. Second quote I'd like to read before we start is from Captain John Dillon. Uh, he wrote his comments in 1924. 
And Mr. Dillon, in my opinion, wrote the first book, scholarly book on the Pennsylvania rifle, not only more than just a utilitarian tool, but a distinctive art form that evolved uh, right here in Pennsylvania. So uh, you have to remember 1924, we were still in the horse culture here. Uh, automobiles had not become uh, mainstay yet in America. So all his research was done on horseback, uh, the saddle of a horse, like many who came before him. And he also was born in the last quarter of the 19th century, or in the 18th century, I'm sorry. So he interviewed a lot of gunsmiths that were still a direct connection to the guard. These were men who were still practicing a trade through the apprentice uh, master uh, structure that was here and learned from the old time gunsmiths. So he is sort of what I consider the connecting link between the 18th century gunmaker and our research that we do today. So in 1924, Mr. Dillon wrote, from a bar of soft wrought iron, hand forged into a gun barrel, bored and rifled with handmade tools, fitted with a stock hand hewn from a maple tree in the neighboring forest, and supplied with a lock hammer to shape on the anvil, an unknown smith in a shop long since silent, fashioned a rifle which changed the course of world history, made possible the settlement of a continent, and ultimately freed our country of foreign domination. Light in weight, graceful in line, economical in consumption of powder and lead, fatally precise, distinctly American. It sprang into immediate popularity and for a hundred years was a model often slightly varied, but never radically changed. So that's, I think, uh, kind of sums it up pretty good. I think his uh, comments are, are pretty well taken from his research. So as researchers of 18th century technologies and 18th century trades, historic trades, many times to identify um, items that uh, we consider material culture, uh, have become known as material culture. Uh, we look at three levels of criteria and it doesn't matter if you go back to it. It could be a Roman sword or it could be a piece of uh, Egyptian pottery or it could be an 18th century tool or whatever. We normally look at the material that was made to use it. We look at the tools that were made or that were employed to manipulate those materials into the finished product. And we look also at the technology used to employ those tools to make that finished product. So tools, materials, and technology is mostly what we look at. Those can many times identify where it was made, uh, how it was made, and so forth. But in the case of the uh, Pennsylvania rifle, I suggest today that there's a fourth element that we also look at, and that's the cultural uh, ingredient that was put into these guns. And with Pennsylvania being the great melting pot or the great experiment with William Penn, I think there was a very successful product came out of that uh, being known now, of course, we call it the American long rifle or in a sense the Pennsylvania long rifle. Uh, there's a lot of cultural ingredients that went into these guns that um, made them what they were. So in other words, a Lancaster County gun is different than a Berks County gun, which is different from a York County gun, which is different than a Lehigh County gun. And most of that has to do with the people groups who emigrated here from where they came in Europe, or where they came in England, or where they came from in Scotland, where they settled with the people groups around them. And those cultural influences all wind up amalgamating into a hybrid product that we now know as the American long rifle. So when, when Colonel Hanger made his comments, what he was really realizing is that through this amalgamation of cultures and technology, the American long rifle has became the pinnacle of all the best of the best from the European trades and European markets. So that's, I think, what makes it distinctly American and distinctly American with whatever else was going on at the time. So that, with that said, um, my main focus today was gonna be run through uh, the gun shops in the 18th century, how these things were made, the technologies that were used, and um, we'll go through some other points of interest and then in the end we'll open it up for questions I'm sure we can get into some very specific things uh, when we get to that point. So I'll flip this around. Sort of to understand what was going on in Eastern Pennsylvania, we have to back up a little bit, just give you a brief history of what was going on from where these gunsmiths immigrated from. So the bulk of gunsmiths working in Eastern Pennsylvania were Germanic in their origins. Um, there are some British uh, 
mixed in with that, some French mixed in with that as well, uh, and some other people groups uh, from Wales, from, uh, from various other areas in Europe. And in those structured environments that these guys came from, there was a definite division of labor. Yes, there were gunsmiths who were trained as master gunsmiths, and they could make the finished products from raw materials, but the bulk of the, trade, of the trade was performed under uh, the, the guild system, which you had specialized division of labor and specialized trades. So you had uh, what we'll call the lock. Uh, the lock is the firing mechanism of a gun. You would have a lock forger. You would have a lock filer. You would have a lock finisher. You would have a lock engraver. You would have a lock trigger. You would have a lock sub. So you'd have at least six different individuals possibly involved in the making of one part. Where in a colonial American gun shop, that task fell on one individual for the most part. And he was responsible for making the finished product from the raw materials he put in the So that guild system, that structured system that was going on in Europe kind of went out the window in colonial America. And uh, again, fell back onto uh, the individuals who uh, were working in shops. When Andreas Albrecht immigrated from Germany in 1751, his first job was uh, working for Daniel Cleese in the locksmith shop at Bethlehem. It wasn't a locksmith shop to make gun locks, it was a locksmith shop that made uh, locks for uh, dower chests, blanket chests, all sorts of cabinetry, doors, uh, padlocks, uh, you name it, any kind of lock they make. He gradually converted that into a gun lock shop and he did gunsmithing work there until he opened the formal gun shop in Christian Spring in 1760. So these guys came over here and did what they knew how to do to start the transfer of individuals. So you kind of get the idea of once you get over here, the division of labor goes out the window, you're on your own. So to be trained as a gunsmith in Colonial America, and specifically in Eastern Pennsylvania, you have at least seven different um, trades that were involved in one trade. So if you were to be a master gunsmith, you needed to be a master of all these trades. And I would suggest that uh, gunsmithing was probably the most complex trade they had practiced in colonial America, where a shoemaker made shoes, a wigmaker made wigs, a blacksmith mostly hammered iron, did very little high end finish work. A gunsmith, of course, uh, had to expand his talents and abilities way above that. So I'd like to run through some of these things with you and maybe elaborate on them a little bit to give you a better idea of the skill level uh, of these gentlemen who made these guns during pretty tumultuous time during our nation's history. And at my shop, we pretty much specialize in Revolutionary War, pre-Revolutionary War items. So that's mostly the focus uh, of our research and the focus of our work. The main reason there is, in that time period, and I personally feel that the gun had reached pretty much its pinnacle. It was still a time period where mode of transportation was mostly on foot. You would carry your gun in hand or you went somewhere. So the guns were lighter in weight, they were well balanced, they were more of an extension of the human body, so they were more shooter friendly, if you want to call it that, or user friendly, than guns that came back. Once uh, we sort of industrialized a little more at the turn of the century, this sort of went down from there. So we'll let that for a little bit. So we'll start, some of these might seem self-explanatory, uh, but blacksmithing would be the first uh, trade that was incorporated into the gunsmith trade. Every iron item on a gun would start at the forge. Today, we use a method called stock removal to make products, and stock removal was not an acceptable new method of manufacturing in the 18th century for two basic reasons. Number one, it wastes a lot of material. We're not really concerned about it today, obviously, we waste a lot of things. So, in period, they did not want to waste a lot of material. So, with a small piece of metal, you can forge that into the shape you were going to use it for instead of cutting away all the excess. Like we do in a machine shop today. So, a forged item is very economical on the material usage, and it also makes a much stronger part than a part that is cut from a single piece of metal or even is cast. A casting is a much weaker part than what a forged part is. The material we use with wrought iron, which is completely different than steel is today, and wrought iron has a great structure in it, much like wood, if you want to compare it to that. So, when you're forging a part, you're forcing the iron into the shape of the part, you're forcing the grain into the shape of the part, therefore making the part far superior in strength than what it, the same part would be if you cut it out of a soft piece or the case. So every part starts at the forge, the barrel starts at the forge, the lock starts at the forge, the trigger starts at the forge, any part on the metal that's made out of iron starts at the forge. And the closer you forge, the better you forge, the better your end product is going to be. So 
So that's the basics. Uh, I mean, in blacksmithing, it's not just hammering out hard and delivering it to a customer. So that's that's uh, the ball molding you see up here on the table, uh, the bullet hole. Uh, people always ask me how long it takes to, to forge one of those. That's a curious question because it's 20 minutes of forging, 15 to 20 minutes of forging, and about three days worth of filing and polishing and fitting and uh, boring and you know, all the other, the forging is the easy part, you know. <laughs> so, uh, they, many people think that forging is the hard part. Forging in many instances is easy. It's everything that goes after that. It's much more difficult. So uh, everything you see on an original rifle, uh, any iron part came from the forge. Screws, uh, any parts are specific to the gun trade. Uh, items that we take for granted today, like screws, both uh, wood screws and machine screws. If you could just go and buy a box full of them at the store, these were all individually handmade one at the time. Most of those started the forge. So in a, uh, with about a half inch off the end of a bar, you can make a three and a half, four inch uh, lock bolt, tack bolt, screw, something like that out of a very economical piece of material. Wood screws were handmade. Each screw was hand forged out and filed, and the threads on the screws were hand filed on. So when you take an antique rifle apart, or one of bar guns with handmade screws, you have to make sure you get the same screw back in the same hole that came out of it because the threads technically could be a little different on every screw, even if they're all hand forged or hand filed. And that's one thing we look at in, in uh, research work. Um, I always ask the, the owners of the guns if I can pull the screws out, and I was puzzled by that. Why would you want to pull the screws out? Well, the hand of the guy who filed those screws differs from one individual to another individual. If I file a screw and my son, the same shop, files a screw, he can probably tell which screw I filed and which screw he filed. So when we're trying to identify the makers in certain shops and in certain areas, a lot of times the product of the hand are things like the wood screws that we can tell who made that gun, who made those screws, the time period those were made. So all those items would be totally made by them in the shops that are part of that space. The second trade is white smithing, and white smithing is the filing and polishing of the metal parts. Uh, once you forge the parts, then they need to be finished. So a lot of white smithing is done. If you look at the rifle barrel that's laying on the table here, the pistol barrel. You'll see it from uh, scalp form all the way to a finished barrel. So it's not just forging it, then it's filing it, polishing it. Uh, that includes a lot of the uh, minor details, the tapering, the flaring, uh, the octagonal portion, 16-sided portion in many cases. So it's, it's file work, but it's precision file work. It's precision polish work. And it's knowing the material, knowing the iron, the properties of the iron. It's, it's uh, white smithing as part of uh, file and brass. Uh, filing silver, um, any of the uh, ferrous or non ferrous parts all get filed. One of the first things I was told as a 17 year old uh, by uh, Wallace Guster, who was then master of the gun shop in Clifton, New Hampshire, he said, If you want to be a gunsmith, you will become a master with the file. You will become an expert with the file. And it was where it rolled off my back at the time. No truer words were ever spoken. If you're going to be a master gunsmith, you will become an expert with a file. That's your, uh, what you need to learn. So, whitesmithing again is basically the finished work on uh, the metallic parts on the gun, being fairs or non fairs metals. Gun stocking, again, might seem self explanatory. That was a separate trade in, in European shops. Uh, and that is taking all the parts, stocking them into the form of the finished rifle. Uh, sounds easy, but not so much. Uh, a rifle or a pistol uh, in the 18th century is a sculpture. It's a piece of sculpture from a block of wood, different material than what Michelangelo would have used in marble or whatever, but you're sculpting that gun in form and in function. There's a lot of intricate details in there that have to be taken into consideration over and above function, form, aesthetics, um, architectural. Uh, the gold of mean, there's the proper architecture to everything um, that goes on in this work. So a complete knowledge of that has to be understood as well as the knowledge of the tools, which tool to use to do which jobs, which one are more efficient uh, to do each particular job. So, so that would be uh, the gun stocking. Also within that trade uh, would come the ornament as well. A lot of the guns in period were were decorated with unique carving, with incised carving, which requires uh, a complete knowledge of ornament. And that was taught in their apprenticeship. 
uh, mostly the Baroque period and Rococo period of art uh, was used in these guns. So a complete understanding of art form and application would have to be understood as well. Again, in Europe, that was a separate trade. Uh, in America, it was lumped in with what you were doing. Boundary work, again, a separate trade uh, in Europe. Uh, a lot of the brass parts, uh, silver parts uh, are done by casting, uh, which involves mold making, pattern making, not just the casting process alone, but how you get to the casting part. Molds need to be made, patterns need to be made. Uh, an understanding of the materials, what the building temperature is, what the cooling temperature is, <coughs> excuse me, and so forth. So, so complete knowledge of foundry work uh, has to be uh, understood as well. And you'll see some of that as well up on the table here where we have uh, some blanks that are uh, cast, some finished products that are cast. Um, when, we, when we get to the uh, question part of it, uh, we can get back into that a little more. Think about that. Questions on that, not that well. That's, uh, that's the one that is fairly well self explanatory. The knowledge of machining. Um, there was nobody else uh, in Philly, America that was going to finish the barrels for you, finish your locks for you, finish the triggers for you. That was all, up, again, a responsibility of the gunsmith. So the boring, reaming, rifling of the barrels was all the uh, responsibility of the gunsmith. Not just the work, but the machines to do the work. You had to build your own rifle right bench, boring bench, and all the tooling to operate those uh, machines, as well as the knowledge on how to use those tools. The same with the lock, which is the firing mechanism of the gun, uh, more complex mechanism, uh, most people realize. A lot of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the 18th century locks that were taken apart, these were all fitted completely by hand. There were no lathes, uh, the milling machines, things like that. And I found tolerances in these locks down to uh, thousands of an inch, or in some places minus you know, some thousands of an inch, several tenths of thousands of an inch. Really precision uh, work done completely by hand. I joke a lot of times, uh, I have 18th century locks that are better shaped than a brand new lock I can buy today that comes out of the machine shop because the tolerance is much worse today. By 18th century standards, about half the round is fine. So, so knowledge of machining. Uh, and again, not just the machining itself, but the tools to do the machine. Uh, there's some tools up here, some barrel making tools and things like that that I brought along today, just to give you an idea of what some of these things look like, and that the gunsmith itself would have made these tools completely by hand for his own use of the shop. And that was part of the apprentice's uh, responsibilities as well. In a gun trade specifically, the apprenticeships usually ran seven years, so they started the boys right about the time they were 14 years old. So with the idea being by the time you were 21, you finished your apprenticeship and you could decide whether you want to be a journeyman or you want to go shop. And the only real difference between a journeyman or a master gunsmith at that point in time was whether you worked for someone else or whether you ran your own shop. The skill level was the same. So when you, uh, as you were serving your seven years apprenticeship, throughout the course of that time, <laughs> You would make your own set of tools from scratch and raw materials so that by the time you finish your apprenticeship, you would leave that shop with a complete set of tools of the trade, along with what they call the arts and industries of the trade. That's in a lot of period documents that we find in the uh, apprenticeships and uh, indenturements. Uh, they don't like to go in detail because those things are closely guarded secrets. They'll just say that we'll teach you the arts and industries. Metal engraving, uh, lump that in together with the metal engraving and wood carving again, even though that was part of the gun stocking. Uh, that does require, uh, a, again, a complete knowledge of ornament where you have to have an understanding not only of the process to create that, but the process to design it. And uh, there were several design books that kind of lingered on from the 16th and 17th century that these guys could get their hands on to learn these things from, but most of it was taught in the shop and most of it was taught uh, master of apprentice, master of apprentice. You see the style of design of ornament in Colonial America, specifically in the US, was quite different than what was going on in Europe, obviously. This was a, an artistic form that was sort of developed here and was a closely known thing going to practice here. 
So that goes through uh, those areas. As far as immigration patterns, and I, I got asked to uh, if we'd speak a little bit on that. Uh, by, by roughly 1770 or 1780, approximately, if I'm remembering correctly, 40 to 45 percent of the population in eastern Pennsylvania were Germanic speaking people. Uh, English came in at about 30 percent or so, and the other people were just made up the rest. So uh, heavily, heavily Germanic speaking people in southeastern Pennsylvania. The 30 percent that were that were English speaking seemed to be centralized over around Philadelphia, uh, Chester County, and in that area. But if you get away from there, you get western there, and it's mostly all Germanic. The French Huguenots come in, uh, they show up in, in the Reading area. So you'll see a lot more French influence in the guns up along Berks County, uh, Reading area up there. You see a lot of heavier French influence than you see, say, in Lancaster County, New York County. You see that in there. And sprinkled in there were a few of the English trained gunsmiths, formerly trained gunsmith John Newcomer, who worked in Lancaster and also moved over to Hell and worked along the career of Hell. Uh, uh, was an English trained gunsman and pretty much made his guns look like English guns the whole part of his career. So he was smack dab in the middle of the Germanic culture and continued to make English guns. And I guess it worked for him because he stayed in business a long time. Uh, then you, uh, some of these uh, areas then get opened up for immigration when they uh, opened up the Shenandoah Valley. They filled that up mostly with Scots Irish. They brought a lot of those people in through between Philadelphia, brought them right down to Wagner Road. And the Scotch Irish had no gunsmiths because it was illegal over there, over there for them to be doing guns. So they picked up gunsmiths in Lancaster County and York County, mostly of Germanic origin. And as they went down into the Shenandoah Valley, you'll find the earliest guns that come out of that region have a much more stronger uh, Germanic look to them than in the decades that follows because as as they started working for a more British clientele, that influence started to permeate the work a little bit more, and they started to kind of uh, evolve into. Uh, you can tell it was still made by a German gunsmith, but it had a, enough English in it that it satisfied the customers. So, again, it depends what uh, exact geographic location you were in. Uh, the end product is directly related to the cultural. Position there. A few years back, I don't know if many of you remember, Lenniter did just a wonderful exhibit over there. It was called Paint Pattern of People. Uh, and it was a very scholarly study of the immigration of people groups into eastern Pennsylvania and where each one of these people groups settled and what the cultural influence was that spilled out into the, to the decorative arts and into the material culture. And that goes from everything to iron work to wagons to uh, structural buildings to gunsmith to silver work to you know, the cultural uh, blending reaches out into all manner of uh, material culture. How we doing with time? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, you sort of get the idea here uh, with the, the skill level that was required uh, at an 18th century gun shop in comparison maybe to some of the other trades. Uh, some of the shops that uh, kept more meticulous records, we have a better idea of what went on on a daily basis. And uh, sometimes it's pretty humorous and, and sometimes it's uh, it's not. So what I find in reading 18th century documents that are uh, written by the individuals who were living at that time period is people will change very much. Uh, what bothered them in 1750 is still a concern for us today, family locations, uh, help, you know, they write about these things in their journals. And I find that uh, we have a very close connection to these folks, uh, not only personally, but again, locationally. I was talking with the gentleman up here in the beginning, asked about target shooting and things like that. And uh, I have some period documents at home where they, uh, they reprimanded the younger guys in town because all they wanted to do was go out and target shoot all day long and want to work. So it started to become a problem. So they called them all in. They said, look, you know, uh, we got to do something about this. I know you guys like to shoot, but uh, we still have to get the work done. So uh, at one point in time, uh, they banned all target shooting uh, during, uh, during work hours. So uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, I kind of brought just a, a short list here 
uh, just to give you a little idea of what I find in period documents. And this is by no means a comprehensive list. This was just something I sat down this morning and wrote up real quick uh, as an afterthought of items that were made by gunsmiths that we documented uh, through uh, period documents or through actual, the actual objects. And you'll find some of them a little bit interesting. Um, if you don't know what some of these are, um, you can when we get to questions and answers, so feel free to ask about any of these things. But some of them are pretty basic. Uh, some gun related, some ungun related. So I'm just going to go down through the list. And this is what these guys were making on a daily basis over and above making the rifles. Toe worms, ball pullers, and sundry uh, gun cleaning tools. That's pretty basic what you think they would be making gun cleaning tools. Bullet molds and sprue nippers, <laughs> bullet casting labels of various types. And you think those were made by the blacksmith shop, but many times they were not. They were made by the gunsmiths. Turn screws, flint mapping hammers for a period what was called a gun hammer. Uh, adjustable powder measures. Uh, these were made out of brass, iron, and silver. And these were a little bit difficult to make. Uh, so these were most of the time made in the gunsmith shop out of the, the, the different horses. So vent fix, fire steels, and a fire steel is what we call flint striker today. When you start a fire with flint steel, a fire steel is the tool that you use to do that. A lot of those were made by the gunsmiths. Patch knives, belt knives, and skinning knives. Again, knives. There are blacksmiths that made knives. But at a different level than what the gunsmiths If you see the knives that were made by the gunsmith, whitesmithing, all these skills, the machining, you'll, you'll see a whole different level of workmanship into a tool that a gunsmith made versus a tool that a blacksmith made, or anything like that. You'll see a little different level of artisanship or workmanship in these things. Uh, belt axes. Um, a belt axe was a requirement when Washington came through York and was putting rifle companies together under the requirement that every man could join the rifle company. And have a bell axe, so somebody had to make them. Sometimes the blacksmith shops did make them, but many times it was gunsmith shops that were tasked to make them. Those. Tomahawks, same thing. Many of these guys that went on the rifle companies that signed up for Washington's rifle companies chose to carry a bell axe and a tomahawk. The difference being a bell axe is mostly a camp tool, chopping wood, uh, that kind of thing, where the tomahawk is a fight uh, instrument. Bayonets, a lot of those were made by the gunsmiths. Because they had the expertise, the skills, and the tooling. <laughs> then we go over, and we're helping the women out. Spatulas, ladles, and forks, and various kitchen utensils. I find a lot of those made in gun uh, shops. Uh, a lot of them in the day books that survived when they made these things, they repaired these things. So uh, if a woman had items in her kitchen that uh, needed, were in need of repair, many times they took them over to the gunsmith, and the gunsmith was the go to guy to repair these things. This one will uh, find interesting coffee mills. So I'm sure everybody knows what a coffee mill is. A lot of the coffee mills were made in the gunsmith shops. Uh, again, because they not only had uh, the tooling to do the woodwork, they also had the skill and ability to do the metal work uh, to make the thing actually operate. Find bowls either made out of pewter, uh, bowls made out of brass, and bowls made out of iron. So they worked in a of working all these mediums. And this one was uh, interesting. The rolling pins. So, uh, I found the documentation in gunsmith shops that they were making rolling pins at one point in time. Amber tongs, door locks, trunk locks, and various furniture locks. Again, we touched on it a little bit at the beginning that uh, if you didn't have a lock maker uh, in your community, the go to guy was a gunsmith because he knew how to make uh, locks. And uh, I've had some guns in my shop for restoration work where the springs uh, inside. The patch boxes, which are real early guns, were very experimental at the time. A lot of the springs looked exactly like the springs inside a door lock. So they were cross referencing technology when they started experimenting with metal patch boxes. Uh, they didn't know quite what to do as far as kicking the doors open, what spring to use, so they gravitated to the springs they already knew how to make in the door locks. Uh, their clockwork, I've seen the same type of spring, tall case clock. Uh, you'll see that technology uh, used in the guns. Well, so you know they were probably doing some clock work as well, uh, repair work, that type of thing. Uh, pewter spoons and the molds for pewter spoons. A lot of gunsmiths made pewter spoons. Uh, they were a big item in the 18th century. Every household mostly had them. Uh, you used to pour a pewter spoon and you could have a mold to pour it in. So the gunsmith not only made the mold, but they also were taxed many times with making the spoons. Butter molds. Uh, those things were a dime a dozen. You see them around all over the place. And I found evidence in the gunsmith shops that uh, they also produced butter molds. Uh, 
uh, musical instruments. Uh, some of these guys made violins, cellos, and other stringed instruments. So you wouldn't think they'd have time to do that. But, uh, I found uh, there's a couple uh, out there that were made by uh, the Antis brothers, uh, William Antis. Uh, there's other ones as well. Uh, this one's interesting, pipe organs. <clears throat> a lot of churches in the 18th century had pipe organs. And who better to get to craft one from raw materials from scratch? Uh, they would make the pipe organ, they would install it, and then they would also service it. Uh, Jacob Loesch, uh, who was a uh, master gunsmith uh, in uh, Christian Spring, Pennsylvania, he had a pretty good side business going on traveling around the countryside to pipe organs. He was uh, kind of a good two guys to two organs, so he would go all over the place within course travel distance, uh, shooting organs. And then when they moved to North Carolina, he did the same thing. Set up the gun shop down there, and then in the spare time went out to organs. Tools of the trade. Um, that's uh, pretty broad, but uh, there's a lot of specialty tools used in the gunsmith trade. Tools that other allied trades are not using. Um, barrel making tools, lock making tools, a lot of stocking tools that are not used in the cabin shop, not used uh, in uh, uh, maybe, uh, some of the other shops. And I also find that uh, some of the gunsmith shops were making tools for the other trades. Um, since they were making their own saw blades, a lot of times for specialty jobs in the gun shop, when the cabin shop needed a saw, those guys didn't work at metal, they didn't understand the tree that they were set to, they didn't do any of that stuff. They'd get the gunsmith to make a saw or reset the teeth, resharpen the saws, that kind of thing. So I find gunsmith making tools for other trades as well. So pretty, uh, a pretty diverse group of individuals, uh, pretty diverse skill sets, but a lot of these guys. Uh, and again, it wasn't just uh, 10 or 12 of these individuals working. There were literally hundreds of gunsmiths working in Eastern Pennsylvania prior to the Revolutionary War, during the Revolutionary War. After the war sort of thinned out a little bit, a lot of people were pressed into service for the war effort. Not all those, of course, became a master of the trade. They were just pressed into service to get material out as quickly as they could get it out. It was a great demand uh, during that time. But there were a lot of individuals that uh, they would go off into other avenues as well. But uh, they were trained in this trade, they had to serve a full set of their apprenticeship. So I'm going to uh, sort of let it go at that. Um, I have one thing that I want to. Uh, mentioned here in the end before we open it up to questions. I've seen this quote before. I'm not sure who said it, but I always thought it was fitting. He who works with his hands is a laborer. He who works with his hands and his head is a craftsman. He who works with his hands, his head, and his heart is an artisan. And I submit to you today that the men who worked in this trade in the 18th century are true artisans. With, uh, what they've accomplished and what they managed to do in the shops that were here without electric lighting. Um, you know, we got the benefits of these things today. And I think about that many times when I'm doing jobs. You know, uh, if, I, if I did not have the benefit of electric lighting, I'd have to reschedule my whole day because there's certain jobs you do early in the morning, certain jobs you do in the middle of the day, and certain jobs you do at the end of the day. If you want to do. I go out in the morning now, I can work at the forge all day long. Then I would probably want to be able to do that. The light was low, I could see the color of the metal. Go ahead. That's the question, Scott. There, uh, what, can you explain the difference between them and, and also maybe point out some of the items uh, and what they're used for? Okay, uh, sure. We can do that. Um, we'll start at the end of the table and go across. I brought small parts because of the limited space. I didn't want to bring rifle barrels, so we brought pistol barrels, but to uh, give you the same idea. Um, again, machining or stock removal was not a method of manufacture, so everything starts at the forge. So we're forging, um, start from, this is the finished barrel, okay? So that barrel starts as a flat piece of wrought iron goes to the forge, it gets folded into a cup shape, like you see here, folded into a U shape, then starting at the center and working to the edges and to the ends, that's brought together and forge welded together. Now this material is wrought iron, not steel. Uh, so you could forge weld, when you forge weld wrought iron, there's no seam 
in it once it's forged welded correctly. That's basically creating a piece of seamless tubing. So that's forged around a, around a mandrel to give you a piece of basically iron tubing. And at that point, you could go in with reamers. They didn't drill through metal like we drill today. So the boring bits on, a, on an 18th century boring machine to cut off the sides and off the front. So the method of boring, uh, this would start out with a, with a quarter inch hole in it, and then we would bore it up to whatever size we wanted the caliber to be. And to make, they made all their own boring bits, of course. So the people ask me all the time, well, how'd you get a straight hole in there? Well, the method of manufacturing dictates the method of machining. So by starting with bits that are both short in length and small in diameter, and as, as you bore the barrel up uh, to the bigger diameter, you also increase the length of the cut. So as you increase the length of the cut, that will pick up smaller perfections that the smaller bit did not pick up. So from the time I start boring the barrel, the first bit I use is maybe two inches long, something like that. The last bit I use is 14 inches long. So the, by the time I'm traveling inside here with a 14 inch long bit, I've created a perfectly straight hole in the barrel. How do you get the full length of the barrel? Well, you start with a bigger scale. So again, I didn't want to bring big stuff in here today. So to do a rifle barrel, this is the size we'd use to start with for the pistol barrel. Um, to do a rifle barrel, I'd usually start, depending on what size I want to end up, if I start with about a 40 inch or 44 inch piece of iron. So it's a much kind of bit that is- uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, my bits that I use are the same size, no matter if I'm boring a pistol barrel or a rifle barrel. So the boring bench is the same size. Just machining a shorter piece of metal versus a longer piece of metal. So, and in the end, this is the finished barrel. You should be welcome to come up and look at these things at the end. That's completely bored and reamed on the inside. The breech plug is machined and fit, and then the outside is all white smith and polished. So, that's a finished barrel from a piece of roller. Is the outside finished if you can concentric with the inside board? Correct. That's right. So, you forge as like in this one's forged. We would always finish the bore first. So once it's forged into a tube, we'll finish the inside, bore it, ream it, uh, get it. And then of course we'll scrap, scrap the outside and then finish the outside down to be concentric to the inside. It's a, uh, I always say it's a bit of trickery. You know, you're, the, you're making it appear that the bore is exactly on center, but it's kind of backwards. You're making the outside connected to the finished bore. How do you get the octagonal shape on that? That's hammered. You do all that by hand? By hand. Oh, yeah. Just by hand and by eye. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, I tell people all the time, you know, you people underestimate your abilities. People are capable, the human being is capable of doing so much more than they realize they are. Uh, it's not until you do these things that you realize you have that inherent in you, that feeling for proportion and size. Uh, I don't use any gauges in any of my barrels. I hammer the taper and the flare and everything into them just strictly by eye as I do it all. Just, uh, just seem to come out in the end. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any scientific <laughs> reason for that. Uh, other than uh, experience, you know, the more of these things that you do, the better you, you get at it. When I was at the museum shop, I used to get interns uh, every summer or their college interns. And uh, everybody wanted to build a rifle the first day of carving. <laughs> they started the forge making nails because they didn't know how to operate a fire. They didn't know how to control it. They didn't know how to control a piece of metal. They didn't know how to control a hammer. So they would make nails or make small parts to teach them hammer control, hand-to-eye coordination. All those things need to be taught before you can do the more complex jobs. Could you please discuss the origin of rifling? and how they get those grooves on the inside of the barrel. And it must be difficult to do. Difficult is a relative term. Uh, <laughs> rifling uh, dates back to around 1440 is the earliest uh, uh, references that I believe we found in rifling. So by 1770, it was a 300-year-old you know, process. Uh, rifling is the cutting of spiral grooves or straight grooves. There were a lot of straight rifle barrels being made in the 18th century. Um, it's the cutting of grooves inside the barrel so that the, the patch and ball, it will grip the patch and ball uh, better and make the gun more accurate. Uh, the straight grooves or the straight rifle barrels were so that it would deliver a patch valve ball with much more accuracy than a smooth bore. 
The most difficult thing with the smooth bore is sealing it, keeping the gases behind the patch and ball. So the straight rifle barrels uh, would deliver a patch and ball with a lot more accuracy, and you could also shoot shot out of them. So they were a little more versatile. You could shoot shot in a, in a round ball and shoot a round ball up better. The spiral rifle barrels, um, they, they were uh, much more accurate for long distance. And that's what Colonel Hanger was talking about. Uh, there was a lot of counts of the Revolutionary War where colonial snipers were shooting British troops at 300, 400 yards. That was completely unheard of at the time. Uh, but those are done on a rifling, on a rifling bench. Uh, and I don't have a photo. Of, well, yeah, uh, we're rifling a barrel right there. So the barrel's mounted stationary, and there's a cutter, a single tooth cutter that's made on the end of a rod. Um, the drum of the rifler is hand carved with the pitch of the rifling that you want inside your barrels. So once you make your machine, you're confined to that pitch. Uh, the one that we use is a one turn of 56 inches. So that's what I find more uh, in original work. Eastern Pennsylvania guns that still retain the original bore, I find the one of 56 most prevalent in there. So. And that cutter would be mounted, in simplistic terms, that cutter is mounted in the rifling bench and it's pulled through the barrel uh, by hand. And the cutter is turned on the same pitch that you're drumming your rifles carved to. Um, but you're only taking a few tenths of a thousandths at a time in one groove. <laughs> So you pull it through, push it back, index to the next groove. You go all seven grooves around, shim the cutter up a little deeper, repeat the process. Pull it through, push it back, go to the next groove, pull it through, push it back, go all seven grooves, shim the cutter up. Two guys, it takes two guys roughly 12 hours to, to rifle a barrel. So you have 24 hours of man time. And How many passes is that? A lot. <laughs> a lot. How do they determine what's the optimum amount? That's, again, um, not to give you a vague answer, but that's what they call the arts and mysteries of the trade. You know, everybody wanted to have a better mousetrap so that they, uh, they wouldn't tell you, you know, all oh, my barrels are better because I have a secret rifle pitch, you know. Well, we have ways of checking that today. And again, the one in 56 was prevalent. They actually had game twist rifle in the 18th century too. And what game twist is, is it starts slow at the breech and then speeds up as it gets to the muzzle. So they might start at one and 96 at the breech and it'll exit the muzzle at 148. That stabilizes the ball extremely well, especially for heavy charges at long distance. Right thing uh, obviously makes it, it more accurate. Than, I think up to about 300 yards more accurate, very accurate than up to a thousand yards, if I'm correct. But, but my question is, it also creates a problem where it lasts but where it takes longer to load. Correct. And if you could address that, because mm -hmm. the, the musket could be loaded, I think, three times in a, in a minute. Three shots a minute. But the, the rifle uh, but took longer. And I believe part of that was because <coughs> the right wing part was easy to clean. Not necessarily. The, it's just slower to load because you're patching. In a musket, you're talking about a musket, military musket that they can load three shots in there. They're just, yeah, they're just putting paper at a ball down, you know, dumping it down. And they're not shooting to point of aim. They're volleying. They're shooting, you know, they're chuck, they're throwing a bunch of lead at one group while they're throwing a bunch of lead back. And the unlucky guy is the guy gets hit. Whereas with a rifle, you're specifically shooting to point of aim. So you're you're loading differently in a rifle than you are. Uh, in a musket, so you're loading powder, patch, and ball, a measured charge of powder, uh, a patch, and a ball to make the rifle effective. So that's why you really didn't have rifle companies on the front lines too much. They used more guerrilla tactics in the revolution. They didn't use as many rifles in the Revolutionary War for that reason, in part, didn't they, correct? Uh, they were still more smooth for. Oh, yeah, on the. For the regular troops, yeah, for the regular troops, because they were still, for a large part, their tactics also, but right, but in uh, Pennsylvania, right, I think it helps the uh, well, we, we as Americans use uh, sharpshooting a little bit more. Yeah, that'd be a whole other that'd lecture for a whole other day is the effectiveness of the American rifleman in the revolution. <laughs> we could go hours on that. Yes, ma'am. How long did it actually take to make? Start to in period, it's hard for us to tell because 
we've never developed the efficiency or the proficiency that they had in the period. But it takes us uh, usually a minimum of 500, 600 hours uh, to do one. And many times it's much more than that. Um, two factors involved there. Uh, today, the level of artisanship or, or workmanship that's required by my customers far exceeds for the most times what you see on period work. And that, that's not to mean that their quality wasn't good. It, it means that they didn't fuss around with things that they felt didn't really matter. The backs of the butt plates were not finished highly, the insides of the trigger guards under the barrels. Uh, if you didn't see it, it didn't matter. Today, customers wouldn't be satisfied with that. They want, it, they want their gun to look like a piece of jewelry in every, in every place. So uh, we have to you know, rise to that occasion and work at a higher level of finish for the most part. How many do you think they worked at at one time? Hard to say. I mean, um, some of these shops had a dozen going on all at one time. Other shops had one or two going on. And that's another thing, you know. Um, most period shops, they made their rifle. Uh, so they made the same gun over and over and over and over again. Most of the time we don't, uh, especially in our custom orders. Um, we're making an, an individual creation, an individual piece of artwork for this customer. The next one we start is going to be completely different. So it's not like we can go to the forge and make uh, 10 triggers of all the same. And that's what they did in period when they were training apprentices. Send a guy out to the forge, give him a bucket, and tell him when it's full triggers, you come in. You know? uh, every trigger we make is different because that's a product of the hand of the maker. And again, uh, if, we're, uh, if we're doing a York County gun, the trigger is fashioned a little different than a Lancaster County gun, different than a Burks County gun. So it's not like we can make a lot of parts to be efficient at it. Most of the time, we're doing one off things. The only place that doesn't pertain is when we're forging uh, generic things like lock bolts, tank bolts, and screw blanks, and things like that. We can knock a dozen or so of them out. I don't make 100 of them at a time, but we'll make you know, a dozen or so uh, and crack and just put them aside so when we're ready for them in the shop. We don't have to start forging them and forging them ready to go. How prevalent were the shop? Did every little town have a shop? Or, yeah, the size of York, what, how many were they at? York was a pretty big uh, gun making center because it was right on the wagon road, Lancaster as well. The further you get out into the backcountry, the less uh, prevalent they would have been. Also, because the population decreases too when you get into the backcountry a little more. So, I say, uh, I mean, York had literally uh, dozens of gunsmiths working right in the town of York and also. Uh, in the outskirts of York. The barrel mill was in York. Uh, they had a barrel mill in Lancaster as well, producing rifle barrels for the trade. Now they would just produce a barrel blank and then that blank would get taken to the gunsmith shop. He would bore it, rifle it, ream it, finish the outside, breach it. You know, they were just producing forge tubes. That's it. That's what the barrel mills did. Uh, south of uh, Reading or the Wyomissing Creek, there were nine barrel mills in operation by the Revolutionary War. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, gun making industry, sort of in that type of. Situation. Are there any good books about the rifle? There's books, but all of them are, you're going to get little bits and pieces, you know, here and there and everywhere. I'd say there's not a comprehensive book that you can go out and learn all about that's made of all rifles. Wow. Yes, ma'am. I'm World War II, my father was in charge of our shell shop. Yeah, Walter. Right. <laughs> yeah, the cottage industry, they used to call that cottage yeah. industry. And that wasn't so much in the 18th century, you really didn't see that much here. Uh, but you did see that in Europe. That was that was you know, the Brits did that all the time. Uh, I mean they were the they were the Ollies of the world at the time. They were shipping stuff all over the place. And to do that, they had cottage industry just cranking out stuff right and left. So they could ship these things all over the place. The, um, go ahead. Well, I want to ask a little more about the whitesmithing. When you're doing finishing work, are you normally doing your final pass just an extra fine file or were they using polishing compounds then? They did have polishing compounds, but um, files are another things that are curious to me because in the 18th century, the selection of files was vast compared to what we could get our hands on today because we're not a handwork society anymore. We don't have the selection of tools that they had in the 18th 
19th century, which was a handwork society. So um, I can get a, a file finish that's that's pretty good, even with the files we have access to today. Not just because of the tool, but how you use the tool, and, you know, the methods that you use the tool in. And when we teach classes, that's one of the most difficult things to teach somebody is how to file. It sounds a little crazy, but uh, how to file, how to file a flat surface number two, and how to file a smooth flat surface number three. Most difficult thing to do for most is to file a smooth flat surface, free of imperfections. <laughs> it sounds easy, but not so much easier. But yeah, you can get a, a really good file finish for the file. Uh, some guns were scraped in certain areas, uh, like up in Lehigh County, again, in the back country and the more remote locations where finish wasn't as, as critical. Uh, they would get a file surface and then they would scrape it many times like a cabinet shop, which was cabinet scrapers. It was it the same kind of as a cabinet scraper? Yeah. They would just run on it. Yeah, just with a scraper. You know, pretty simple tool. Um, we make all various kinds. We make them up for finishing inside of barrel channels and all that stuff. So uh, they have a scrape finish, but none of those guns were decorated guns that I've seen with a scrape finish. They were all relatively plain guns. When you get them in cross light, uh, you can see, see the minute little flats, you know, on the radius surfaces. Not many flat areas on a gun. Everything's radius. There's transition areas all over the place. Uh, things are moving in all directions. So. John, could you go step by step what you do from start to finish to make one of these guys? How long you have? <laughs> <laughs> All afternoon. Do you um, start with this with the wooden stock or the barrel? Where do you start? Well, we, you always start with the barrel. And uh, again, I teach when we teach classes or when I taught Institute of Mass Valley. Um, the easiest way to explain that is if you had a blank piece of paper and you were going to design a rifle, you start to breach the barrel. Everything. Uh, the breech of the barrel is the back end of the barrel. Everything on the gun is dimensioned and designed from the breech of the barrel out in all directions. So the barrel, you need the barrel before you can do anything. So if you're making a rifle uh, completely by hand, the barrel is the first thing you have to make. Uh, once you have the barrel made, the barrel then could be uh, put into the wood, hand fit down into the wood. That was done uh, with planes. There's a barrel and letting plane uh, laying up here on the table. These were also handmade by the gunsmiths because the planes that were used in the cabinet shop or in the joiner shop or a wheelwright shop would not be serviceable for doing gunsmith work. So they mostly made their own planes and uh, plane the ramrod channel and those types of things. So the barrel would get fit into the wood. After that, the lock, which is the firing mechanism for the gun. If you're going to make this, then this would all have to be completely made by hand. The last one of these that I made by hand was six weeks <clears throat> along with the raw materials. So that would have to be totally finished. And then that would get put into the gun. Then the triggers put in in relation to the lock and so forth. So, so once you have a certain amount of the parts put in, you have a big chunk of wood, but uh, that's when the sculpting starts. So that's when you have to dimension everything out, uh, and start basically sculpting the stock out of the block of wood. Yes, my, and for me, my father ran a shell shop in Springfield, Pennsylvania. One day, he told me, put his head down and said, all I have is wood for apps. Where am I supposed to make my book? <laughs> I, I know you said uh, at one point that this was the most expensive item that a uh, colonial person, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. Other than real estate. If, uh, other than real estate. What, what did they charge the or what would the gunsmith charge at that time? And, and then maybe to put it in relation, what uh, all your man hours, I, I don't know what you charge for a rough range for, for your. If I could go to Burger King, probably get about the same. Per hour, <laughs> <laughs> and that's one thing working in the arts. Um, it's very difficult to get paid by the arts. Mostly working for the most time for an agreed price. You agree to make the product for the price that the gentleman agrees to pay for it. You know, um, so it's, it's hard because people don't understand handwork anymore. They don't realize the time involved in handwork. There are some people, folks that do, but for the most part, 
that's not a, a, something that people understand today. It's, it's the concept of hand work. We have a lot of time that gets into it. Which was the clone? I was going to say the, the other part. When I was still with the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission, the, the closest that I could ever figure that to is in broad terms is it cost the man in the, in the colonial period about one third of his yearly income to purchase a decorated rifle. So it's vague, I know, but then if you could put that in today's terms, put it in your own terms, whatever you, about one third of your yearly income, that's what it cost me. And uh, I, I don't know if it was you, there's another gentleman before we started, uh, I told him, you have to remember, not everybody had a brand new rifle. You know, these things were passed down from generation to generation. So not everybody went out and bought an 18, Hundred and had to have the latest and greatest brand of gun. Many many people at the turn of the century were still shooting revolutionary guns. There's nothing wrong with them. They were actually, there were better guns than ours. How long have you been doing it? Forty years. And how so, many are in your shop? In my how shop. How many people in your shop? Just myself and my oldest son. Now I had uh, three at one time. Uh, it was a three man shop at one time. I had a guy work for me for twenty two years. Uh, he retired. I joke and say he retired three times, but uh, he retired for a week and then came back. He said, I, I need something to do. Do you have any work for me? Sure. <laughs> that was about then he, went, then he went six months and said, okay, this time I'm retired. Then he came back a third time. <laughs> okay, no. So, yeah. Was there some type of a gluing mm -hmm. process used to keep the metal from uh, turning to, to rust? You know, okay. Time? Yeah. I'll address that. Uh, again, this isn't steel, it's wrought iron. So what wrought iron is, it's iron ore dug right out of the ground that's hammered. There's a little bit of, of uh, lime put into it to drive out the impurities, but it's not an alloy of any type. So it's a material that's already been down in the ground for thousands of years. So you're bringing it out, you're hammering the impurities out of it, and you're making a part out of it. So uh, wrought iron does not rust like steel rusts. I tell people all the time, you put that's why you're digging up artifacts from the Middle Ages. And you can still see what the artifact is. If you put a piece of steel underground next year, there'll be nothing there. It'll be just powder. So that's one of the reasons why they didn't concern themselves too much with, with the oxidizing of the metals. But they did have some finishing techniques. One was called a russet finish, which is what you're going to see on these two guns. Um, and a russet finish is basically a controlled rusting, uh, light oxidation. And uh, if you didn't want your gun finished bright, uh, like most of the finishes would have been, they would have just polished the guns and left them bright. Uh, I, I tell people all the time, it's like us going into Lowe's today and buying a brand new shovel and going up to the counter and say, can you rust this all up for me before I take it home? They'd look at you like you're crazy. So they didn't, they didn't rust the stuff up or oxidize the guns when they were new. They mostly left them bright, but they did have the rust that finish. And then they also had another process called uh, charcoal bluing which you find on European guns. And I have seen evidence of it on probably a handful of American guns, pre-Revolution or guns, or guns. It takes a lot of time to do it. It's a, it's a pretty big expense in labor. Um, charcoal bluing is a thick scaly blue that's, that's put on the surface of the barrel. The ones that I've seen that have the charcoal bluing on where it's starting to flake off, it's a pretty rough surface underneath. So I'm not really sure if they did the charcoal bluing to expedite the finishing, or if they left it rough on purpose so the charcoal wood had something to get to. That I can't really tell you. Uh, but those are the two finishes that I've seen, other than just polishing them, leaving them bright. It would have been the russet finish and then the charcoal wood finish. But typically, not many finishes were done on the metal because it didn't rust really anyway. With the russet finish, was that just a, a chemical reaction that you would just brush on and let it sit? Right. Is it an acid? Or yeah, a it's salt? nitric acid. Yeah, hard nitric. Which is was the stadium, iron nitrate sustaining medium that was used on outdoor weaponry. That dates all the way back to the Romans. They used it on crossbows and outdoor weaponry. That stayed in play in the gun trade up until the end of the Civil War. Uh, there was no uh, alcohol stains or oil based stains. There was no walnut stain or cherry stain or anything like that. Iron nitrate uh, is a chemical reaction stain, uh, it's, it's, it's made with nitric acid, diluted with water with iron filings dissolved in it. And that's put on the wood, and then a heat source is, is added to the wood, and that creates the chemical reaction. Uh, the wood fibers and that gives you the colors that you see.
Yes, sir. I want to tell you first that I think that your presentation is magnificent. And I've learned so much today. I came in here thinking that, well, a gun maker is not, uh, and he sets up shop and he, he goes out and finds somebody who makes barrels. And then he goes and buys a, a chunk of uh, a walnut or some other wood. And then uh, he goes to the hardware store and, and buys a lock. And then he spends all his time putting all this together. But you sure did uh, be a whole lot here. Well, that goes on today. Uh, again, this is the resurgence in reproduction work. Yeah. Not again, 99.9% .9 of reproductions out there today are done just that way. Yeah. Uh, they're going to buy parts of a catalog and they're, they're just assembling the parts. Traditional work is a completely different ballgame where you're making the parts from raw materials and you're using the same tools, technology, and materials that were employed in the 18th century. So that's always been where my interest level was, was in the traditional <laughs> end of it. And that's pretty rare today to find that. Colonial Williamsburg uh, still operates their shop that way. Yes, ma'am. Did you make your tools? Yes, for the most part. Uh, the specialty tools, again, you can't buy them. Can't go to Sears and buy a barrel and lay a tool together or something like that. So, uh, in tools, uh, the two main tools that were imported in the 18th century uh, files and saw blades, uh, hacksaw blades, mostly metal blades. Wood saws, uh, they mostly made here, but uh, metal saws and files were still an imported item even in the 18th century. So, the gunsmith would not be making the files. Uh, there were probably a half a dozen uh, companies in England that were making files at the time. And you could go through their tool catalogs and just pick out whatever you want. Okay. Now, during the Revolutionary War years, when trade was cut off, uh, that was cut off as well. So you do find some handmade files and handmade, uh, a lot of handmade tools during the war years. I have some in my own personal collection that are dated 1775, 1779. Uh, I'll be lucky enough to find a tool that has a date on it. But it's interesting because they would, uh, you need a tool and you can't buy it, you have to make it. So some creative uh, tool making was done. At certain periods of time. How often do you see uh, double set triggers on the historical pieces? It seems like everyone likes a little reproduction. Well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> and a lot of the reproductions, your tolerances are so sloppy, like we talked about earlier, that the double set trigger is a spring loaded mechanism, it just slaps a gun to get it to go off. There's no precision there. Uh, but on a precision gun, a single trigger is still your best trigger mechanism because there's a mechanical feel there and you have, you're using uh, the geometry and the mechanical leverage in your hand and set up correctly in the gun, that's a mechanical lever, the trigger is a lever in the gun. So you can get more repeatable shot after shot after shot with a single trigger gun than you'll ever be able to achieve in my opinion with a double set trigger. And were they able to pivot for the trigger, is that normally just going through the wood on the stock? Do you find like when you're looking at really old ones, how, how does that stand up after? There's no real pressure on that. And there's, you know, it's, that's not uh, a lot of movement there. So there's not much wear factor. The thing that's the biggest uh, fly in the ointment there is that they use an iron pin and an iron trigger. And through the lack of usage over the years, there's a rust a lot of times. So that's one. But wear factor almost non-existent. What's the preferred wood for the stuff? Curly maple. Once uh, the gunsmiths got over here from Europe and discovered curly maple, it was game over. You know, uh, it's pretty much the superior gunstock wood. Ash is a good secondary wood. Uh, so you have maple and ash, both white woods. Birch was used. I found birch in inventories uh, in eastern Pennsylvania. Walnut uh, was in inventories in eastern Pennsylvania as well. Um, and I always get funny looks when I tell people walnut is the worst choice you can make for a gun stock. And uh, because all modern guns are made out of walnut, but yet modern guns are mass produced when they're using mechanized machinery. If they would use a piece of hard curly maple or ash, it would chew their cutters up and spit them right out. But, uh, so walnut is a soft, pliable wood you can machine easy, but as far as quality for a gun stock, uh, not so much. So, and that's why you find it on the lower grade guns in the 18th century, military guns where they're just more or less producing them as fast as they can. You'll find walnut on military guns and on low-grade phallic pieces, and 
you do find it on some pistols, some nice, nicer guns now and again, you find it uh, because it's the old school gunsmiths were used to working in it. That's what they worked for in exclusively in Europe. So when they got over here, they still liked working on it to a certain degree. Uh, maple and ash are hard to work. They're, they're contrary. <laughs> they're good uh, quality wise. They're very good, but they're contrary to work where walnut is easily worked. You know, um, I think it was, but I don't think it was as um, important. I think it was more inherent in the work than it was purposeful in work. In other words, we use it in our shop a lot of times without even knowing we use it. You know, um, we're setting up a patch box on a gun, and uh, I get it on there. I get it where I want it, where it looks right to me, and then I measure it. Yeah, it falls right into the you know, proportion wise. And I think that was, they might have taught that in period. Uh, there's no, I've never found a reference to that in period, but yet I'd say a good 80% of original work will somewhat follow that to a certain extent. Not all uh, by any means, but uh, I think it's, and I don't want to say it's by accident because it's not, it's taught uh, a sense of proportioning. I always tell guys in the classes when we teach, if it looks crooked, it is crooked. If it looks out of proportion, it is out of proportion. You know? Trust your, you know, your instincts. And you know, the history on, I mean, how did that, did somebody just decide that it was going to be the 35 or whatever it is? I think it's nature. If yeah, you, um, it's all it, taken off of nature. Yeah, it's all based off of nature. How a tree grows, how, mm -hmm. how ferns grow. If you look at the ferns, I saw a 16th century pattern at one time, gunsmith pattern. And it's a lot of drawings of, of scroll work based on plant growth and plant origin. Leafage, you know, leaves, uh, how a leaf grows, what the proportions and things like that. And you, it's in architecture too, you know, columns, the proportions of column moldings, crown moldings, uh, you know, you name it, they're all proportioned using that same methodology, whether it's intentional or not, whether we're so, so ingrained in us from, from seeing nature you know, our whole lives, whether that's so great or else it just happens naturally. I've never used a set of sticks to be able to see what's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, if it looks off, it is off. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find too when you study enough original work, uh, especially in lock work, things that function in moving parts. And there's architecture that's prime architecture, geometry that's prime geometry that actually works, and then there's others that not so much, you know. Uh, I'm a fan of German locks on my guns because the German locks, in my opinion, have the premier uh, geometry. They actually work where they're supposed to work. British locks, not so much. The Brits, again, being traders on the world market, they were more worried about marketing. So every little gimmick and trick. Uh, advertising hasn't changed much today from 250 years ago. They put a little a little roller or wheel on the spring and said, look, ours is better. It has a little roller on it. They tell people the first time it gets powder residue, you want to lock up and then the whole thing turns into a skid. You know, so, <laughs> you know I, I think the dramatic stuff was actually stouter, stronger, better geometry, made the function last longer. It's just my personal opinion from studying original work, incorporating that geometry. You sometimes see rifles with a really profound curve on, on the butt plate. Well, what was the idea behind that? Were they bracing it? Press it back here? Yeah. That was an evolutionary um, thing. Um, you don't find that on early guns, revolutionary, pre revolutionary early guns. Mostly, you don't even really find it on too many 18th century guns. Now, fourth quarter of the 18th century, you'll see some of that just starting to come into play. Um, it more is an evolutionary thing. I think um, the actual reasoning behind it, I couldn't begin to tell you because it's not comfortable. Now, I guess they thought maybe it would it would sh shoulder in there better, something like that. But you also see that happening as calibers shrink. Um, on, in eastern Pennsylvania, as the large game gets shot off for the most part, the buffalo disappear, uh, the deer disappear, bear disappear, calibers start coming down for squirrel hunting and turkey hunting. That's when you see that starting to come in. Uh, larger bore guns with more recoil, you don't see that happening too much until you get into the small bore guns. It sort of evolved at the same time. Any online questions?
they all went to sleep. <laughs> They were the go to guys. Some of them, you know, human beings are human beings. Some of them were pillars in their community and they were the they were the go to guy for just about everything. Some of them were kind of scoundrels, you know. <laughs> but not many. I'll say you don't see that too much. More of them, uh, some of the guys that you might think were scoundrels were more characters, you know. They just uh, ungovernable. They didn't want to conform, so they sort of went their own way. Um, they were good gunsmiths. Some of them, Jacob Loesch was like that. He got called in front of the elders time after time after time uh, for not following the rules, not following the rules. And finally, they just said, you know, we appreciate it if you packed up your tools and went somewhere else. Very talented gunsmith, very genius. He's the guy that made the organs, tuned all the organs and all that stuff. Uh, but he just didn't like to follow rules too much. I don't know if you grew if you grew up in much of a German Pennsylvania German society, but they're big on rules, you know. <laughs> Were they wealthy then at the time, or like blue collar, like just big blue collar? Um, or was it? Today? You know, it was a handwork society, so you were you weren't a ditch digger. I think they were they were recognized for their talents and skills, and uh, same as a clockmaker in a way. Uh, tall case clocks, you're familiar with what we're talking about there. Uh, the guys that made clocks, pretty complex mechanism, and, and you had clockmakers in period uh, that made everything. Uh, John Fisher, who worked right here in York, he was known to have made every single part in his clocks. He could paint. Uh, when he did painted Dow clocks, he did always painting. A lot of times the clockmakers farmed that stuff out. When he engraved his clocks on a brass Dow clock, he did all the engraving. He even made his own cases. A lot of times that got farmed out to the cabinet shop. But he was the one clockmaker that kind of uh, rose to the occasion and, and made every single part of the clock. So he was he was a pretty impressive guy in his community right here in New York. And just to say frankly, there's just stop it. Just talk with him, get his opinions on things when he was coming. John Fisher, right down the street. And a pretty impressive guy when you figure he, I uh, forget what year he immigrated. Was it 70, 50, something? First talk he made 47. Was 70, 60. Okay. He came over here 15 years old and his whole family died on the voyage over. So he got off the boat in Philadelphia and worked at 15 years old and rose to be one of the most prominent members in New York. He was here during the Continental Convention. Pretty impressive guy. I've read about rifles where uh, the barrels are made cast off, but they're not directly in line with the uh, of the rifle. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like how common was it and how, how much? It's common on 18th century rifles. Both of these rifles have cast off in roughly a quarter of an inch. And what he's talking about there is if you put a center line right down the middle of the gun, the back end of the gun is not on center with the board, it's cast off about a quarter of an inch. And that's so that when you shoulder the gun and put your cheek on it, your eye will be back on the center line of the board. If you stopped it straight, um, your face is on the side of the gun, not in the center of the gun. So you would be all your eye would be all centered to the to the sights. So the cast off allows you when you naturally point the gun, your eye naturally comes back to the center line of the board. So if, if, if for, for a righty, it, it's going further right. Just so, right. And it's more, it was more used on early guns with bigger front stocks. When you get into little skinny later guns, you don't see it much anymore because they, they're close enough, you know. <laughs> so it kind of evolved out of the trade uh, by the mid 19th century when the front stocks became a little skinny and the barrels were bigger. But you can see it on these if you want there. afterwards if you want to come up, I'll show you. Flip the gun around with the bloodstock pointing away. And if you look down, you'll be able to see it. But that's part of sculpting a gun, you know, making the gun by hand being able to, to do that without having a rough change in the, in the architecture of the gun. There were, I mean, there, there's left-handed guns made today in period. It was extremely rare. I have seen 18th century left-handed guns. But uh, the biggest problem with that was a left-handed lock. 
uh, you know, basically there were no locks being made left-handed. So the gunsmith would have to create a lock left-handed just for that particular job. So, but I'm not going to say it wasn't done. It was done, but uh, very rare. Same with boys' rifles. There were boys' rifles made in the 18th century, scaled down guns, uh, but not many. Pretty rare. Plus, you had a whole slew of boys coming along. You weren't going to get too many years out of it. So, you, uh, anybody that got a boys' rifle made and spent that money better have a bunch of boys coming along, spaced out, you know, to get a good many years of use. Any more questions? Okay, let's give Brad a big round of applause. Our meeting is adjourned. I'd like to speak with Brad individually. He'll hang around for a little bit, I guess.